Well, uh, hello everyone. Uh, thank you for coming to my talk. And um, I'd like to start by saying that this is work that was done um, on the theory side by a really outstanding student, um, now a postdoc at the Flatiron Institute, Hayden Nunley. And this is all a collaboration with the experimental group of Jen Ping Fu at the University of Michigan, and particularly with his student, Xu Feng Shui. Um, all right, so the basic question I wanna talk about today is suppose I start with a uh, group of undifferentiated cells um, in culture plated on a, on a um, confined to a disc, um, and they are going to differentiate, and they're going to differentiate into two different kinds of cells, neural plate in the center, neural plate border on the edges. And what we wanna consider is can we do this without biochemical signals? Um, so specifically, um, there, there is an experimental system that we're thinking about that potentially does this. And I'll start by telling you about some evidence for mechanical influences on the fate pattern in this system. Um, and then um, I will uh, tell you a little bit about a mathematical model of coupling of mechanical stress to cell fate and, um, how, and that, that shows how this could work. And that, that is plausible that it could work and that we would get a fate pattern by using mechanics instead of chemical signals. Um, and this makes a particularly strong prediction, which is how the domain size, so the size of the outer NPB region, depends on the substrate stiffness and that is non-monotonic. And I'll show you that we can confirm that prediction. Um, and then I will sort of add a twist, which is that so, so you know, we have a nice mechanical story and it has a non-trivial prediction and we can confirm it. But okay, the question is, is that enough to be sure it's mechanics or could something else be masquerading as mechanics? Um, and I will uh, argue that something else could be masquerading as mechanics that, that you, it needs a chemical signaling system would have to satisfy fairly stringent complaint, uh, constraints on the way its mechanobiology uh, interacts with substrate stiffness, but that, um, but that, that would be enough to- Sorry, David. Um, yeah, but- um, just, just a quick interruption. A problem, but it seems to have been resolved. Um, Sorry, okay, there are so, participants- so, yeah, at that, that it is in principle possible for, um, for chemistry to masquerade as mechanics, even at the level of depending on substrate stiffness. And um, I will leave you then with a bit of a cliffhanger because we don't have a final experimental answer to which thing is going on. But uh, one way or another, we, we have an interesting system. And, and maybe then I will leave you also with a meta thought, which is this is an example of how models can be useful in biology because the model pushed the experimental um, investigations in a particular direction and ask questions we wouldn't otherwise have asked and turned up things that, you know, maybe we don't completely understand yet, but that has, um, you know, at least as given us interesting new ex experiments to think about. Okay, so with that outline in mind, um, I'm going to uh, start by me, reminding you a little bit about, um, about what we know about development. So to make an animal, you have to pattern cell fate. So you have to have, you know, liver cells and brain cells, and they have to be in the right place and not, you know, mixed with each other when they shouldn't be. Um, and, um, and you have to have morphogenesis. So organs have to uh, take the right, the right shape, and this requires physical forces and cells pushing and pulling against each other and moving around. And a sort of a textbook view of how development works would be that you have first fate patterns and then morphogenesis. And um, a widely uh, believed model for how fate patterns can happen, certainly not the only one, but, but a prominent one, is the famous French flag model, which says that you have a morphogen, that is you have a diffusing chemical with concentration C of X as a function of position X. And, um, and this sets a basic length scale for the patterns. And as and um, different fates, so for example, the blue, white, and red fates, happen as you cross different thresholds in the level of C of X. So you'd be blue if you're above the, uh, the, the blue threshold, red if you're below the red threshold, and white in between. And so in this way, you can take a, a graded concentration profile and translate it into a, a, a blue, white, red pattern. Okay. And then having done that, you would then get morphogenesis. So for example, the white cells knowing that they're white, would say, aha, we are white and we are going to carry out the, the developmental program appropriate to our fate. 
And um, so we're going to undergo apical contraction, for example. And, and so you'll get pattern mechanical forces that then drive shape change to give you the, the final shape of the organ. Okay, so, so this is the standard view of the way this thing happens. And there's certainly plenty of examples where this is the way it happens. Um, but can it go the other way? Can mechanics influence cell fate? And it's well known that at least in some cases it can. In particular, going back to very famous work from Dennis Discher, um, it's known that if you played out single cells, single um, stem cells of various sorts on substrates, the fate they take depends on the stiffness of the substrate, um, in, in, but in a cell autonomous way. So this is single cells of dotting a fate. Um, there's also more recently been evidence of how um, mechanics can interact with patterning, particularly for cases where you have migratory cells. So for example, in the formation of um, patterns of, of feather buds or hairs on vertebrate epidermis. Um, this is work from Amy Shire um, and going drawing on theories that go back to, to the 80s by Murray and Oster. Um, so, so certainly the mechanics can influence fate. What is much, so yes, mechanics can influence fate, great. What is much less clear is can, can mechanics really do the same thing that a chemical morphogen does? So that is um, convey information between cells so replace essentially a, a morphogen, a chemical concentration with a stress and specify stress in a fate dependent matter. And in particular, get a pattern length scale from a stress profile. And so what we'd like to, what I'd like to do today then is explore a system where this might be happening. Um, okay, so this system is neural induction and briefly in vivo in a vertebrate um, at a certain stage of development, the ectoderm, so the outer of the three germ layers um, and the dorsal part of the ectoderm differentiates into, differentiates into different fates. Um, in the most dorsal part, so in the center here in, is the neural plate, and this is going to become the, um, the, the vertebral column and various other things. And on either side of it, there is neural plate border or what I will mostly call NPB. Um, and so that is here and here in the, the lighter green. And um, this MPB will eventually differentiate into neural crest, which um, then at a certain point, the cells become migratory and spread out and do all sorts of, of different things. Um, and so classically, this, this uh, pattern of fates is thought to come from chemical signals and particularly from a BMP gradient that comes from the spamon organizer, which is in a different germ layer. And so you get neural plate at low BMP activity and then MPB as the activity becomes higher. Okay, so um, Jen Ping's group and, and Zhu Feng set out to try to recapitulate this with um, human pluripotent stem cells in vitro. So what you do is you plate the cells onto a micro pattern substrate so that they are um, confined to a circular domain. You put in neural differentiation medium, which has various magic factors that you think um, can, can help neural differentiation. Um, and then you let it mature for a while, quite several days actually. And, and what they see is they see based on um, well-known um, markers, uh, expression of well-known markers of these fates, that you get neural plate in the center of the circular, um, of, of the, the circular domain and NPB around the outside. Um, and this, there is some reason to believe that this is not driven by chemical gradients, at least it's not driven by the most obvious ones. So in particular, there are no exogenous morphogen gradients, which is what there is in vivo because the BMP again comes from a different germ layer. Um, and they've ruled out that, that there's endogenous B BMP signaling that BMP is secreted by these cells in a way that's important. And also that there's an endogenous nodal signal. All right. Um, and so, so this is a picture of, of actual data of the pattern. So NPB fate is marked by various markers in, and I'm going to focus for the rest of this talk on one marker PAX3 which I will always show in green. And so what we're going to be looking for then is circular patterns where you have a green domain on the outside and there are other markers on the inside that I could show in a different color, but in the interest of, of having a very simple picture of what's going on, I'm just going to always talk about getting this green domain on the outside and how big this green domain is. All right, so uh, there's some evidence this is not done by chemistry or not done by chemical signals, at least some have been ruled out. On the other hand, there is considerable evidence that mechanics does play a role. And the key experiment here is that they could set up a microfluidic system where you have a little microchamber here whose pressure you can change. And by um, imposing a higher pressure in the microchamber, 
you stretch the cells on top of it. Um, and if you stretch the cells, what you see, so, so control, no stretching, you have green on the outside and not green on the inside. That's the, the, the standard pattern. But if you stretch, everything becomes green. So, so clearly mechanical stretching biases cells towards the MPV fate. And this combined with the fact that there are no exogenous gradients and it's definitely not being done by BMP, led us to wonder whether there could really be mechanical signaling that in the control case is giving us the pattern with green on the outside. Um, okay, and so, um, so the question then is, could, what would be stretching the outer domain in the control case? And so this is where we as theorists come in and we started thinking about what, what would a model wherein you get fate from mechanics look like. And for this, you need two things. Uh, to start with, you need to understand the mechanics of a cell layer on an elastic substrate. And this has been worked out um, independently at about the same time by um, Edwards and Schwartz and by Banerjee and Marchetti. Um, and, and the idea is the following. So I have an, an in-plane stress sigma, and I, I'm going to, uh, I'll say all of the equations I'm going to show here are the 1D version of the model because that's the simplest thing. We have done proper 2D calculations with fully tensorial stress and so forth and nothing terribly important changes, although obviously there are little quantitative changes. Um, okay, so, so the 1D version is you have an in-plane stress sigma and then um, in the limit of a thin substrate or if you're culturing um, your system not on continuous substrate but on microposts, there, there is a substrate deflection U and attraction force minus KU that comes from, that there's an elastic force that the substrate exerts on the contracting layer and vice versa. Um, and again, we've thought about the case where we're not in the thin substrate limit, but I'm gonna focus on the thin substrate limit in the interest of time. Um, so then you have um, force balance, which says that the divergence of the stress is equal to the traction force you're getting from the substrate. Um, the, act of the cell layer in aqua here is actively contracting, and that is described by a target strain, so the strain it would like to have, P of X. You can, this is proportional to an active stress if you prefer to think of those units. Um, and combining these, what you find is that the stress um, satisfies a simple differential equation that looks like essentially screen diffusion with a source. And the important point is that there's a length scale in this, and the length scale has to do with ratios of elastic properties of the cell layer and the substrate. And in particular, as the substrate gets stiffer, so as, as K gets larger, the length scale decreases like one over square root of K. All right. And, and so this is enough to tell you that, that mechanics is able that, you know, even though you often think of elasticity as not having, as um, being long range, not having baked in length scales, Mechanics, when you put it on a substrate, is able to set a length scale and give you something, you know, a gradient that's somewhat akin to a morphogen gradient. Um, all right. And um, you can ask at least whether the experimental system uh, matches this mechanical model. And so to do that, you culture the, the stem cells on microposts. And so um, here's a picture, a little picture of microposts. So every little dot here is a micropost you can see the deflection of the posts and thereby infer the uh, traction force between the cell layer and the posts. And so you, and we can plot the average micropost deflection as a function of radius, so distance from the center of the colony. Um, blue is the data, red is a fit. Um, and what you can see here is that this, this, um, this deflection curve has a lot of structure. Um, and indeed, what we find is that to, to match, is to fit the experimental curve, you need um, three different types of cells with three different contractilities. So um, blue and red circles here are the boundaries between three different cell domains indicated by one, two, and three stars. Um, and these three different types of cells are, are more or less contractile, the ones at the outside are the most contractile. Um, and this is surprising because we know we get a fate pattern with two kinds of fates, um, neuroplate and neuroplate border. So why do I get a third contractility? And the answer appears to be that the cells at the very edge and, and the outermost region is about one cell wide are more contractile because they know they're at the edge. So they know they don't have proper um, contacts with neighboring cells all the way around that sort of one side is free and this makes them more contractile. Mm -hmm. And this is in, in fact, um, a fairly common observation in cultured cell colonies. Okay, so, so in terms of mechanics, the, the system looks like it, it behaves like a fairly simple contractile layer 
on top of an elastic substrate, but it's a contractile layer then with three different um, zones of contractility corresponding to the two fates, but then the MPB fate has um, these cells at the outer edge that are different because they know they're at the outer edge. Um, to this, we wanna add cell fate. And we're going to do this with the phenomenological variable W. So, so we, ha we have two fates, and this means if we wanna do phenomenology about phase specification, we need at a minimum a bistable system. So we have this variable W that lives in a bistable potential. And if it's near zero, we say we have neural, neural plate. And if it's near one, we have, say we have neural plate border. Um, and we're going to couple this to the mechanics. Um, and the signs of these couplings are determined by experiments. So the post data tells us that the MPB is more contractile. And so that means that W in effect activates stress. Stretching data tells us that stress favors NPB fate. And so again, we have an um, a, a stress activates W. Um, the basic mechanics says that stress leaks out into the substrate, so it looks like it's self-inhibitory. And by stability means that you need W to be self-activating. Um, and what's interesting is that these signs do not give you a linear pattern forming instability of a Turing sort, which is what we were first looking for. But instead, what we have is we have pattern here that's really driven by the fact that you're on a finite size domain and there's higher contractility at the edge. So, so the picture is we have contractile cells at the edge and they're creating a stress field that then propagates in towards the center and, um, and leads to a fate. Okay, so putting it all together then, we have um, a simple a, a dynamics for a W that is, has a bistable term and couples it linearly to the stress because linear is the simplest lowest order allowed coupling. And then um, we couple the contractility linearly to the fate plus a term that tells you the edge is more contractile. Um, and so again, we have a single here, here's a sort of a cartoon. There's one cell on the edge that is somewhat more spread at the edge and more contractile. And this leads to a gradient of, of traction forces and stress going inwards towards the center. Um, and this biases cells towards the MPB fate, but, in, and importantly, this gives us a green region that is more than just the one contractile cell at the edge. So that, um, so, so that really within this model, at least cells next to the contractile cell are seeing the stress from the contractile cell and that is biasing them to be MPB cells. All right, so good. Um, how do we think about this qualitatively? And in particular, what we would like to then predict is how wide should the outer green MPB region be as a function of various parameters? Um, there's a nice limit in which you could do many things analytically, and this is the limit in which you have a domain wall in W. So essentially the link scale of W goes to zero. Um, as an aside for the theorists, um, this you know, domain wall approximations and um, you know, boundary layers and things are of course very well known. Um, doing the full tensorial version of this in 2D involves some extra tricks and subtleties that was kind of fun. Um, but, but the basic idea is that you have this bistable thing and if it's link scale is short, it makes sort of a sharp transition from zero to one. Um, and this happens at a critical stress sigma C. So if I have a stress profile from the outside towards the inside that's decaying exponentially because I have loss of contraction that's a stress source at the outside, then, there, then when we hit sigma C, we will change from green to not green and that will set the size of the MPB region. Okay. Um, and you can see from this story that there is a non-trivial prediction which is that the size of the MPP domain should be non-monotonic in the substrate stiffness. So remember the substrate stiffness gives you this link scale L um, and the stress profile depends on L in two ways. It decays exponentially with the link scale L, but there's also a prefactor in front that is one over L. And so what that means is that for very large L you get in purple a fast decay, but you start from something high from very small L, you get a slow decay, but you, um, but you start from something low. And both of these will tend to give you a smaller colony. And then there's some intermediate L where the prefactor is sort of intermediate and the link scale is intermediate. In blue here, where you will get a much larger colony because the point at which we cross the threshold sigma C is farther out. Okay, um, so, so we predict then that if patterning is mechanical, you should, the width of the, the pattern MPV domain should depend non-monotonically on the substrate stiffness. And, and this, this seems like a very nice prediction because substrate stiffness is sort of inherently mechanical. And so if you see non-trivial dependence on stiffness, you, it looks like mechanics. Okay, 
Um, so uh, Zhu Feng went and did the experiment um, because I think it's more striking if you look at the pictures before I show you a plot, here's a picture. So this is, um, so here this is grayscale, but um, bright is what was, was otherwise green. And substrates are stiffer from right to left. And so you can see you get a very thin domain when you have a, a very floppy substrate. In the middle, when you have sort of an intermediate stiffness, you actually get almost all of the cells at the little bit in the center differentiate into NPV. And then at the sides, again, you have a very thin domain. Um, and we can, of course, plot this. Um, so this is domain size in microns versus um, curing agent-based tomonomer radio, radio, ratio, which is telling you something about how stiff the PDMS substrate is. It's a little bit subtle because um, the way the spin coding works, the thickness of the substrate also depends on the, the, this ratio, which is why we've used uh, this as the horizontal axis. Um, but, and in the model, we've taken this thickness variation into account. And so you can see that, that there's a non-monotonic stiffness dependence, which matches decently the, the stars from the model. Okay, so, so this, I was very excited about this because we you know, started with the model, it makes a prediction, the prediction is true. And it would be really cool if we had um, patterning that was really driven by mechanical signals, state patterning driven by mechanical signals. Um, okay. So now, however, we have to pause and ask how, you know, you, my, your first reaction as theorists is to say, okay, non monotonic dependence is, is a non-obvious prediction and we should declare victory. Um, and then you go and you talk to some biologists and they keep on saying, well, are you completely sure it has to be mechanics? So the question is, could something else sort of masquerade as mechanics and give the same non-monotonic dependence on substrate stiffness? So clearly substrate stiffness does something here. But the question is, what if the something it's doing is that cells are autonomously, that is each cell by itself sensing the stiffness and that's changing the way they're signaling but they're not actually communicating with mechanical stresses. Is that possible and what would that look like? Um, and you might imagine that's possible because um, our stress equation looks like screen diffusion. And so diffusing morphogen of course also looks like screen diffusion. And so what you would need then for a mechanical, for, for a chemical signal to mimic mechanical stress would be that you would need the effective parameters in this diffusion equation to depend on substrate stiffness correctly. Um, and specifically, you would need the link scale to vary by a about a factor of 10. So the, um, and the most obvious way to do that would probably be by changing the degradation rate or the degradation time scale tau. Um, and because length scale goes like square root of tau, you would need the degradation time scale, the, so something like the rate of receptor internalization, probably of, of, bound, of occupied receptor internalization, something like that, to vary by at least a factor of, of 100 as you go from stiff to soft substrates. Um, and the idea then would be that if you have a stiff substrate, for some reason the cells sense the stiffness and say, wow, we're going to degrade morphogen like crazy. And then you get rapid degradation and purple morphogen signal would sort of go from the outer cell that's secreting it only a short distance. On a soft substrate, um, cells would, would detect the signal, right? They have to still detect the signal, but not internalize and degrade um, or not much. And you would get a much longer range gradient. All right, so it could be a masquerade instead of a morphogen. Um, but it, it has to be a very particular sort of masquerade and one has very stringent predictions about what the signaling, how the signaling system has to depend on substrate stiffness. Um, so we either have a mechanical morphogen or we've learned something non-obvious about mechanical biology. Probably the obvious candidate for the signaling system if it were signaling would be wind signaling for various reasons. So it's either mechanics or something non-trivial about wind signaling. And as I said, I'm going to leave you on a cliffhanger here because uh, working out carefully whether or not it's wind signaling is, you know, is a long experimental task and we're not there yet. Um, so uh, let me, oh, so I was going to say there's a nice test we're working on, which is to have a mechanically anisotropic substrate. The diffusion, you would not get anisotropic diffusion from that, but you would get an anisotropic mechanical pattern. So, so this is a way to rule out um, a, a, a chemical morphogen in a way that doesn't depend on knocking down particular pathways. And that's something we're working on, making the substrates harder than we thought it would be or harder than Zhu Feng thought it would be. Um, with that, let me conclude. So, um, so in summary, so I've told you about an in vitro model of neural, neural induction, neural fate patterning. 
um, and some evidence the mechanics affects the pattern. And this has led us to a hypothesis that maybe we really have a mechanical morphogen here. Um, and this makes predictions about how patterns depend on substrate stiffness. And these predictions are confirmed. And that's very encouraging. Um, but at the same time, it, we could have a chemical morphogen acting as an imposter. If we do, then it does, it, it, the signaling pathway depends a lot on substrate stiffness, but we haven't ruled that out. So um, yeah, stay tuned for the exciting conclusion um, at some point in the future. Um, with that, uh, thank you all for your attention and I'll take questions. For the nice presentation. So we have a few questions in the chat. The first one is from King John that speaks plus. And I'm sorry, it appears that Can my- Can um, tissue on a dish experiments on- Yeah, so, so Nouris, I'm sorry, start again. For some reason- um, Oh yeah. My speakers are, oh, my goodness, what is going on here? Yeah, we were um, noticing yeah, that we, hmm, okay. we wanted to talk to you and you, yeah, you could not um, hear us. I, I don't know what is happening. The thing, this is very bizarre. Um, okay, so I can hear you if I hold it here. Try talking. <laughs> Maurice? Yeah, that's yeah, that's very that's very strange, okay. David. It's it's somehow like auto lowering the volume. There, I mean, there seems to be some button that thinks it's getting pushed nonstop, and I don't know why. So you... um, because it keeps on turning itself off. I'm going to try something here. Um, ah, okay, that's interesting. Um, I had it in tablet so mode, and we... apparently the button was getting hit in tablet mode. Okay, Nuris, go ahead. We are good to go now. Uh, okay. Does it work now? Yes, it works now. Sorry good. about that. Uh, so the first question, the first question is, can such tissue on a dish experiments be done on very thin substrates to allow for the folding and wrinkling that happened during morph morphogenesis in vivo? Um, I'm, I'm sure it can, um, not, directly with the PDMS substrate that Jinping and Zhufeng use. But, um, but yeah, I mean, I, I'm sure it can be done. Um, and, and certainly this is a, an interesting next question is if there's a mechanical effect here, what is it doing in vivo? Because in vivo, it is interacting in some way with the classic VMP gradient. It's not all be do being done by mechanics in vivo. Okay. The next question is from Adrien Alou. Can you change the size of the size and shape of micro patterns? For example, triangular micro patterns would concentrate mechanical stress and should thus influence spatial pattern of cell fate accordingly? Yes, that can be done. It's something we're thinking about. Um, we have changed the size. The prediction is that the size of the MPB domain depends fairly weakly on, on the size of the circular domain. Um, and that is also what's observed. Um, we've been playing around theoretically with other shapes. We haven't yet found a shape that does something interesting enough that it is, a, that it is the top of our experimental priority list. But, um, but yes, it can be done. You know, lots of people have done it in similar systems and it will certainly be done at some point. Is there any resistance to the cell layer contracting? Um, resist, I'm not, so, so it's on a substrate, it's coupled to the substrate, the substrate resists elastically. I'm not sure what other kind of resistance you might be thinking about, but, um. Is it possible that there's friction in, in the layer that also resists besides the elastic ah. resistance? Ah. Okay, so, um, so the fact that it maintains a non-trivial stress pattern says that the layer is acting more or less elastically and not flowing or displaced or rearranging a lot to relax stresses through dissipative processes. So, so you know, it, it, it couldn't sustain the shear stresses it sustains for days on end if there were lots of, of sort of viscous or frictional relaxation. Okay. The next question is from Rika Aller. Do cells develop planar plurality in this system? Not as far as we can tell. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, it's always hard to say definitely no, but but not in any obvious way. Okay. From Timothy Fassenden, 
Some morphogens exert their effects via temporal oscillations. Do the mechanics or morphogen secretion exhibit any such temporal dynamics? Um, in this system, we have no evidence of temporal dynamics. There are other studies of um, neural plate and neural plate border patterning that are different in the details of the way they're set up that suggests that the duration of receive a morphogen signal is important in determining the fate. Um, we haven't seen that here yet. We have not tried to rule it out in an exceptionally, you know, careful, specific way yet. So from Kinja Daspis was, how is it experimentally determined that cells on the edge are more contractile? Even if um, they were uniformly contractile, there would be more contraction at the edges because it's on the gradient of the active stress, which is naturally higher at the boundaries. Um, so, okay, so there are two things. So one is just that they look more spread at the boundary, but really the evidence is that we have this post-displacement data and um, you can try to fit this with domains of differing contractilities um, and you need the outer cells to be contractile to get this to fit. So, so in other words, you know, we, we have, we see the tractions on the substrate and by force balance from that, you infer the stresses and this stress says that the outer ring of cells is, is contractile, is, is the most contractile. Okay, so how asymmetrically symmetric is the radiation from NP to NPB in this um, in vitro experiment? It is so. Um, so I mean, here's a picture. So it's kind of messy. Um, some of the noise here is probably noise in expression of the reporter, not actually noise in the fate. But, but you can see, so, you know, this is what I'm calling a green domain. So on average, it's, as, it's perfectly symmetric, but in a particular experiment, there's a fair bit of noise. Yeah, I guess I was, I was wondering, are the post deflection results similarly noisy to the, the images that you showed? Yes, they, they, they're similarly noisy 